John chapter 11, we left off last time with a plot to kill, to murder the King of Kings, the I Am, the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then he called to Lazarus. He wasn't in the tomb, but he came back to the place where his body was. Amen. And there he came out when Jesus called for him. Lazarus, come forth, and he did. And we've talked about that, so listen to any of our previous messages if you haven't been with us in our studies. Because that was a threat to these religious men. The institution that they had appointed. Because they might lose their place and their position, they now plotted, the council was called together, what do we do about this man, this man who can raise the dead? And a four-day dead guy, right? I almost said dude. I say dude sometimes. I can't shake it. I know it's not cool anymore. I know. But it just comes out still. I'm not from California. But I picked it up when I came here. Good morning. A four-day dead dude. That's what we've called him, if I'm honest. And Jesus called him out. What do we do about this man? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. We'll lose everything. And then something was said. A serpent slithered in, and this guy suggested, right? Don't you know? Haven't you considered that it would be expedient for us, for the people, really? If we murder him, everything will work out more pleasantly for us. It's more convenient. It's more comfortable for us to kill him so we can have, you know, the best possible life for ourselves, justifying murder, violating the scripture. These are the guys, the dudes, right, who are supposed to uphold it and with their character reflect it, but when it came to getting what they want and keeping what they had, these standards were set aside. For their convenience, for their comfort, it was expedient, we're going to murder him and just sweep it under the rug and keep on living life. So too, man, we haven't changed much, have we? To keep what we want and hold what we have, man, we'll kill anyone who gets in the way. Even at times when it's a direct result of our actions or a consequence of our choices. And God forbid that we would ever excuse murder for the sake of expedience or convenience. Amen? Though we live in a culture that follows suit, we have the opportunity as Christians even if there is a consequence for a choice to stand upon the principles of the Word of God and to uphold the truths that we say we believe. Christian, maybe you've fallen, maybe you've stumbled this week. It's not sweeping it under the rug. It's going to make a real impact on those around you. But it's repenting of your sin and making restitution. That means making it right in whatever way the Lord directs. That's what honors Him. That's what glorifies Him. We're not perfect people. We never were and we still aren't. What we do with our sin, that's the key. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the gift that God offers. It's what he extends to every person. If we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. What a thing, what a God. He offers forgiveness fully a pardon in his holy books, right? All the record of wrongs. And he offers to cleanse it all away if you'll just ask him to believe in the one that he sent. And that's the whole point of this letter that John's writing, amen? Well, because they didn't want to do it, they condemned him to die, and now they're strategizing, they're planning as to how they might take him, find someone to betray him. And surely he's coming to the feast, they said. Verse 55, the Passover was coming. They're watching for him. They're waiting for him. And kind of the the picture is now Jesus moves into the last week uh, before his death and resurrection. John is taking the rest of the time in his gospel here to talk about these days, this last week. Jesus was headed toward Jerusalem. He surely was going to come. And as we said, Uh, No thing and no one would stop him. 
He had an appointment to keep, which we'll go on to read about in verse 12, prophesied some 483 years prior his triumphal entry. Jesus is headed in that direction. So are 2.5 million Jews into the city of Jerusalem. Souls seeking to have their sin covered, their sin forgiven. A mass, a crowd of people. Some 250,000 lambs, we said last time, would be martyred, substitutionally sacrificed for their sin, but only one would come back from the dead. And that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's Jesus. You with me? So amongst a sea of solutions, there's only one who's come back from the dead, and his name is Jesus, and that's why we believe in him. You with me? Verse 1, chapter 12, all that being said, Jesus takes the time to hang out in the house of his friends. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he, what? Raised from the dead. And there they made him, you know these characters by now, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then there's Mary, too, during uh, her thing. And we'll get back to that in a second. But firstly, we zoom in on verse 1 and take note of the activity of Jesus Christ one week out. He's going to go and do the hardest thing. No doubt we see it in the Scripture that he had ever done. We can't even possibly imagine being fully God and fully man. And yes, that's hard to figure out. Right? But nonetheless, we see Jesus' deity in the Gospels and we see his humanity. The fact that he knows all things and yet he's walking in flesh, a suit of skin like you and me, representing us, becoming one of us. We see the, the passion of Jesus poured out in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood and he pleaded with the Father, Father, is there any other way? If not, Okay, your will, not mine, your will be done. How difficult it would have been for Jesus to go to the cross and to suffer at the hands of sinful man. And not just to suffer, but to be able to do something about it. To say, bink, or go away. Whatever he wanted to do, call down a legion of angels and stop this. He could have at any moment, and yet he chose not to because he loved you. That's the only reason. He didn't have anything to prove, but to demonstrate the fact that the Lord loves us, to die for us while we were yet sinners. Difficult. The difficulty of our Lord during this last week, we see it in the Gospels. What's he doing right before he goes into J-Town, as we like to say, Jerusalem, where all this begins. He's hanging out with his friends. He's having some fellowship. These that were dear to him, special to him. And and we've talked about these guys before. Uh, Martha's there, and Lazarus is here, and, and Mary's doing her thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But how wonderful it is to observe, simply observe, that Jesus made time for fellowship here in the his darkest hour, his most difficult day. What was essential? What was important? Well, he's having a potluck, you know, with his disciples. He's hanging out, and they're fellowshipping, and worship is happening, and and witnessing. Well, that's occurring, and it's just a beautiful picture, a scene that we see here. Jesus didn't go into the Garden of Gethsemane alone when he went to pour out his heart in prayer to the Lord, but he took his disciples with him, right? Uh, Not 12, but 11. We'll get to that in a minute, right? But he took his disciples with him. The importance, the priority that our Lord placed on Christian, we would call it Christian fellowship. It's essential. Not that important to those these days. Obviously it is to you. Good job. You made a wise choice. To meet with the Lord today. To come together with your brothers and sisters. The body of Christ that you're privileged to be a part of. You're a little piece, but we're all together pieces and we come together and make a whole. Beautiful it is for the body of Christ in all our languages and colors and cultures to come together and just enjoy the Lord and one another. It's not about organized religion, is it? 
though some will say that. I just, I don't like organized religion. It depends what you're organized around, right? And our prayer is, as I'm sure your heart is, we're going to organize ourselves around the Word of God, around the Lord, and as much as we can just be about Him and enjoy Him and represent Him and help others find Him, the more organized we are and less chaotic, less corrupted. Amen? How important Christian fellowship is. We're living in a culture, again, I think it's increasing. I don't want to go to church. I don't see the need for it when, in fact, we're commanded to make it a priority. And there aren't that many New Testament commandments, are there? But there's one concerning church and the church getting together. Do not forsake. Do not. Don't do it, the Lord says. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner, the custom of some. But all the more, did they put that up? If not, you have a Bible, 1022, we'll give you directions later. Focus on the point. Don't do it. Don't forsake coming together as believers. On Sunday, that's great. During the week, if you can. But some are going to say it's not essential. But I assure you, the Lord declares it is. Two reasons why. And we could come up with 10,000, but we're going to just give you two. Hopefully you can write them down and remember. This will leave a lasting impression on you. What did you talk about in church today? Well, one of the things, we talked about fellowship. We talked about church. And one of the reasons why church and church fellowship is so important, getting together with other believers, is for encouragement. For encouragement. We see it in the scriptures. We know this is true. We observe it in real life. Our enemy loves to isolate, doesn't he? And if he can isolate, he's got you, right? We go back to chapter 10 and that illustration, that metaphor about how the Lord's the good shepherd and we're his sheep. Hang out where the shepherd is and you're going to do all right. And though there are shepherds in this place today, we're talking about the one true good shepherd. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Revelation 2, 3, where's Jesus? In the church. So if he's there, that's where I want to be. I can meet with the Lord out wherever I might be, sure. But there's something special, the Lord says, about this place here and now today. It's because he's here. As his word is opened and his people are assembled. And where the Lord is, that's where I want to be. This is the place where, where we find great encouragement, both spiritually speaking, as we receive from the Lord, as we enjoy his word together, but as we kind of just rub off on each other. Again, one of the great tactics of our enemy is isolating people, and oftentimes if he can isolate you, he can consume you, he can control you. But when we come together, we alleviate the condemnation of our enemy that accusing voice that seeks to separate us from each other. One of the things we learn that we find so encouraging about coming together is we're all really dealing with the same stuff, aren't we? It's a short list, guys, right? Okay, being single's hard, yep. Being married, that's harder, actually, right? That's tough, okay. Having kids, being a parent, well, that's tough. Working in this world and serving ministry, okay. I mean, that's like one hand. I've got a whole other hand over here. Physical issues and, you know, I mean, it's a short list, right? There aren't that many things that we're all struggling with and dealing with. But oftentimes we say and we think, we believe the lie, I'm the only one, no one has it as hard as I do, I may as well just curse God and die. And that's in the Bible, and yet we actually still do it, right? Right? So we come together and we hear and we see and we remember. I'm not alone, but there's camaraderie, there's encouragement when we realize, man, life's pretty simple. It's got a few difficulties. The Lord's the solution, the answer. And we have a part to play in encouraging and building one another up in dealing with all these difficulties. Wonderful thing it is for a person to simply ask for prayer, to receive a word of encouragement, let alone the spiritual uh, ministry that takes place as the Lord is the one directing these things. And statements are made and, and thoughts are shared and, and how the Lord has a way of just building us up, encouraging us simply by making the choice to come. 
was talking to my wife this week, which I like to do a lot. Wonderfully wise lady. We were just talking about the difficulties, right? How hard it is to just, ugh, I'm so tired. I don't want to go. I just got off work. So whatever, right? But when we make the choice, right? Oh, man, that was good. That was great. Something happened. Something occurred. Man, it was super hard to get there, we say. But now that I've been, now that I've received, now that I've been edified and built up, now that hopefully the Holy Spirit is just filling me and flowing from me, wow, okay. And that was worth it, man. And most every time, that'll be our testimony. That'll be our story. That'll be our song. How important it is that we just make that choice. Uh, I I represent a culture that was raised where Sundays were were sacred, and we're now, and if you're my age-ish, Uh, we're watching our culture just abandon that mentality absolutely. And that's sad. It's tragic. And that's because Christians have lacked character, isn't it? We've not taken a stand to say, you know what, Sunday's sacred. And unless there is some monumental thing that I cannot change preventing me from making that standard and setting it for me and my house, I'm going to be there. Says a seasoned saint right there, a wise, wonderful woman, right? We're losing this, and we really shouldn't. And should the whole world, we don't have to. But as for me and my house, we can teach our kids and impart to them the good things of God. They can benefit, they can be blessed. It's important, isn't it? Just to be encouraged in a world that's tearing us down constantly, to remember that you're a part of something so much bigger and so much greater, that there is a God, a Father in heaven, who loves for you, cares for you. It blows wind into our sails, doesn't it? How the Lord is so very good. Encouragement, it's important, it's essential, and it's there when we come together in fellowship. And there are many ways in which we find it. And I encourage you to consider all of those ways. Secondly, with that, just to accountability. This is essential for us as well, isn't it? How easy it is for us to deceive ourselves and go our own way. Before too long, having distanced ourselves from the standard of the Scriptures, the accountability of the body of Christ, we start believing, you know, whatever's coming in our ears and eyes and and whatever the TV says and, uh, God forbid, the preacher on it declares. You with me? Whatever we're hearing from our friends. and, And pretty soon, the purity of our faith is now just, man, it's polluted. And then you come back maybe after six months and you're talking with another brother, another sister who hasn't made the same choice and, man, you could just see like you're like meeting up like this. Like there is, there is something off here. And it's because we, we drift and we get corrupted and we just get dirty as we walk through this world. How important the accountability of the body of Christ is. Attendance, Sure. Sound theology or just pure, potent truth. That's really the key, isn't it? We get bent, we get twisted, we get corrupted. Life hits, and life hits hard. And it hits some of you very hard and right now, doesn't it? How important it is for us to continue to see straightly, navigate the difficulties, the issue of life, uh, the issues of life, because they come, they hit. But to navigate them with uh, biblical spectacles, right? See things through the truth of the Word of God and and stay straight through them. Jesus said again, it's a verse we quote a lot because it's important, he who hears these teachings of mine and does them is like a guy who builds a house, not on sand but on rock. And wind and weather and all kinds of things occur as they do in life. But that one who built his house on the rock, he stood the test of time, right? He stands and has the ability to provide shelter and safety for others and so on and so forth. How important it is for us to realize and remember that there's a standard of truth. We live in the age of emotionality, don't we? The loudest, obnoxious, most emotional voice wins. That's not good right? But if they can impact us or intimidate us, if they can, with their emotions, manipulate us, man, it's, we fall like dominoes. 
There's a standard of truth. God is and God is not, and so on and so forth, right? Whole book of truth here. That if you apply it to your life and do what it says, you will do well. And if you don't, you won't. So easy for us to get our cup corrupted, isn't it? And that's why we've got to come back to the Word and be washed by the pure water of the Word and remember who the Lord is, who we're called to be in Him, the opportunities that sit before us if we'll yield to the work of His Spirit, and so on and so forth. Your marriage will be better. Your house will be more holy, right? Your life will be more, as we say, blessed, because it will be. Taking heed according to the word, keeping the cup clean, guys. Pouring out and then letting the Lord refill. Amen? The accountability of the body of Christ, this pertains to the, as we've described, kind of the work of the Holy Spirit through the word in our lives, but it also applies to confrontation. The loving confrontation of a Christian. Now, there are those who like to be professionals in this area. They don't like you, they don't love you, they just want to confront you, right? That's a problem. The Bible has a few things to say about that. Hopefully we've gone through step one, right? We've built up a reputation as an encourager. You're here, I want to encourage you. And that may then afford me the opportunity to confront you. I've built up some trust. You know I'm not a wacko or a weirdo or a person who thinks they're spiritually appointed to be the sin sniffer in the, in the community, right? You know what I'm talking about. But I've built up a reputation. You know that I love you. I'm for you. And so guess what? I will come to you. And if I see something, man, if the Lord says something, then I'm going to speak with you. And when there is this kind of dynamic uh, of encouragement. When we have these trustworthy kinds of relationships, this stuff can be real simple. It doesn't have to be all dramatic and, and formal and the King James talk comes out, right? But it's just a conversation. Man, did I see this? Did I hear this? It must be wrong. It's not you. What's going on? What's happening? Let's talk. How can I pray for you? Very simple stuff. Are you with me on that? But how important it is to hold each other to the standard of the scriptures that we have been given, that we're all under. And yes, remove the plank out of your eye before you, you tackle the splinter of the other, and so on and so forth. But this is brother and sister kind of stuff, isn't it? If sin is coming after you, you better believe as your big brother, I'm going to say something. I'm going to do something. We have an enemy. He's very real. Sin is his weapon. How dare we not be defenders of one another, knowing that we all have the ability to be led astray. What did Paul say to the church in Galatia? If anyone is caught up in sin, that's your job, brother, sister. Go after them. Be gracious to them because you could do the same thing. Make the same error next week. Right? That's the ACH translation. Paraphrasing stuff these days. Keep it understandable, I pray. That's your job as a brother, as a sister, to encourage and build up an environment of trust to where, man, if something comes, you can deal with it. You can defend the body of Christ. Simply ask a question. Call them out on the carpet. Are you with that? I pray and trust you are. I find it interesting that our Lord made the time for fellowship here. One week out. It's interesting when people talk about, well, it's so hard to go to a small group Bible study. I like to kind of come and hang out in the back or the foyer. Foyer! We're all a... And then I just sneak out and no one knows. That's how I... It's awkward, you see. And it's hard for me, you know. Can you imagine how hard it'd be for Jesus to hang out with people like us? Or, or them? He knows everything. He's sinlessly perfect. Imagine how difficult that would be for the God who's created everything, who says, let there be and there was, to hang out with me, to hang out with you, every motive, every intent. Every, I mean, he just knows it all. And he chooses to love. He's there because they needed him to be there. I don't need church. Good for you. Other people need you. So get to church. 
right? I love that picture. I love that reminder. Let's get over ourselves and let's take advantage of the blessing that God has given us, and that's the body of Christ, right? Always remember that, should that voice whisper in your ear, oh, it's just so hard, and I'm just doing it. Right? The Lord did it. Good enough for him. I think we can get over it, and we can get into it. Amen? Amen. So, hey, all that being said, our Lord makes the time for fellowship, hanging with his disciples. And verse 2 says, there they made him a supper. It's a potluck, man. They're hanging out. And the picture here is, is perfect. It's beautiful, like a, a trinity of ministry with these three, Martha and Lazarus and Mary, each doing different activities, and yet it all facilitates the scene, the work of the ministry, for Jesus to do what Jesus does all doing different things, and yet it comes together harmoniously, beautifully. Martha's servant, right? She's not complaining anymore. Nothing wrong with serving. There are those serving, and, and, and so often they're unrecognized. They're in the parking lot when you drive up. They're in the sound booth working right now. There are people all over this facility and in the, the children's ministry wing and all the rest doing so many things and have done so many things over the course of the week, so this just happens right, to facilitate the teaching of the Word of God in his worship. Martha's serving. She's not complaining. That's beautiful. And that's what servants are called to do. Some have a specific gift of helps, of service. We're all called to do it. But some just have a special knack for it. And that's the reminder that we need to have as servants, man, to serve joyfully, facilitate ministry, and just not complain. That's the key. That's our spot. I love uh, what Lazarus is doing, and of course, we're like, oh, he's just sitting. He's sitting at the table with the Lord, but consider what's taking place. Go forward and read verse 11. Because of what's happening right here, right now, many are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They left the religion and went away with a relationship with Jesus. They believed in him because of the testimony of of Lazarus, and this dude doesn't even really have to say anything, right? You're the guy who, he's like, yeah. And he's like, four day, de- yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, where is he? Can I talk to him? Can I meet with Jesus? Can I hear from him? A walking testimony. Simply a witness of what the Lord had done for him. Now, Lazarus, when you were in the tomb, what did you do to compel or beckon, right? Nothing like that. Jesus just did it. Here's what the Lord did for me. That's all of our story, right? Everyone has a testimony. It's beautiful. We get to share it. But hey, some are more powerful than others. Lazarus had that kind of testimony. So he's just speaking it. He's just sharing it and leading people to the Lord. They did not believe in Lazarus, but they believed in Jesus, verse 11 says. So he's doing his thing. And what a beautiful part to play as he shares his testimony facilitating, as it were, the work of the Lord, the work of the ministry. Mary, verse 3. Mary's worshiping, and we've often talked about all these characters, and specifically Mary, but we're going to go on to read here and talk about the, quite possibly, the most beautiful act of worship that we have in the entire Bible. Martha's servant. This wouldn't have happened without Martha's service. Lazarus is testifying. He's witnessing, right? Uh, An audience was brought together, and Mary's worshiping, and she does something now that blesses everyone in the entire house, and even us this morning, this wonderful act of worship. Read with me now. Then Mary, verse 3, took a pound of very costly oil, Spikenard. You can research that in your own time. A year's wage, very costly, very precious, very hard to make, very rare. Probably her dowry, some will speculate. She took this, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Let this sink in, picture it. Consider it for just a moment. Again, I suppose to you, I don't know that it's true, it's just my opinion, and I share it as such. 
but quite possibly the most beautiful act of worship in the entire Bible for this reason. It's pretty timely, right? She anoints Jesus before he goes to the cross. Mary saw it, she got it, and she did it. If you'll study these things in chronology, this Mary wasn't with the other ladies and Marys who went to the tomb after Jesus was laid in it to put spices on him there, but she does it now. She did this before the Lord went to the cross. She did not go to his body after his death because she knew, she heard, she got it. He wasn't going to stay in the tomb, but he's coming right back out a few days later. A phenomenal observation we can make. The worshiper, the one who sits at the feet of Jesus and actually listened to the things that he said. Remember the disciples. When all this went down, they, they just bailed. They had no clue, right? I kind of relate to that. Just, just heading off, running, denying, and every other such thing. Not Mary. She saw it. She was prepared for it. She believed it. And thus she does this. Gives this gift. Incredible act of worship before the Lord went to the cross. And you'll see what Jesus has to say in regard to it in verse 7 and verse 8. She perceived. She knew. She heard. She listened. Because she sat in that place. The seat of the worshiper waiting on the Lord, ministering to the Lord. That's what worship is, the Bible declares. And thus she, she was with it. She was in step, if you will, in step with the Holy Spirit and with what God was doing. There are those, so too in the body of Christ, man, they sit at the feet of Jesus. They're worshipers. It's not awkward for them to sing in time. Man, I, I come to church after the sing in time so I can get the Bible but that singing stuff, man, that's not for me. Don't raise your hand. Men, God help you. We are missing something if that's our perception of what worship is. You are missing out. Something that's important for you and essential for all those around you as we see them included here. You want to be in step with the Holy Spirit. You want to hear things. You want to see things then become a worshiper. Sit at the feet of Jesus and just spend time in worship. And you can do that here when we're singing. Time's limited. You can do it with all the time that you have. You can put in headphones. Take it with you wherever you go. You can worship God virtually most of the time if you choose to. A song in your heart, singing in your mind, just praises to the Lord. What emphasis the Word of God places on being a worshiper, and yet there's a disconnect today. We think it's like, a concert on one hand, I've been to some concerts, and the connectivity between some worship services and the concerts you go to, it's the same. You can have your opinion, your perspective of that. I don't want to comment to that as much as I want to shed light upon what worship is supposed to be. Anywhere, any place, it's not so much about the instruments used, it's about your heart giving glory and praise and honor to the Lord, giving something of yourself to him, and we'll get to that in a minute, in exchange for what he has to give to you. It's expecting nothing, hopeful in all things. It's just waiting on the Lord. And that's the term that the Bible uses to describe it. I'm just here, thinking about you, thanking you, giving praise and glory to you, just considering who you are and what you've done, and stuff just starts happening, right? Right? You're a worshiper, you know that. If you're not, you don't. That's why we encourage you to be a worshiper. We all get to be worshipers. We all get to learn from Mary and experience the things that she does, that she exemplifies for us here. That's why it's here, guys. But it comes to the one who will sit still. God help we men. I was wondering how to talk about this today, and I did in a certain way first service. I don't know how I will right now. God help us, men. What are you so afraid of? Worship will always cost us something. And that's what we see here. God help we men to get over ourselves. And if it's your, what, pride? I don't sing in church. I mouth it. I mumble it. I don't close my eyes. I don't raise my hands. God help us, men. 
We have scriptural, biblical examples to follow. Good men, men better than you, right? So what's your problem? I love David, right? Love that guy. Like you think you're tough? David, whoop you, right? He, 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 he wrestled a bear and a lion, killed a Philistine giant, right? And he killed so many people that God said, you can't build my temple, you've killed too many people. That's interesting, it's kind of funny, just a little bit, right? Right? He'll roll you if you think you're a tough guy. That's a warrior, right? David's slain is 10,000. I mean, who's going to compete with that? You think you're this, that, or the other. You're a tough guy. David was a worshiper, right? Unrestrained, just didn't care what people thought about him worshiping God. Vibrant in his worship as he was as a warrior. Just loved the Lord, didn't care what people think. You, O oh man of God, need to be like that. I need to be like that. I don't care what your opinion of me is, and I will give that up. I will give that away for the sake of my love for God. If that's a, a mockery that I receive, Mary did here, mocked by Judas. Michael, David's wife, mocked him. And she remained barren for the rest of her days. Judas went out and hung himself. I don't recommend that. David was a worshiper. Blessed by God because of his heart for the Lord. Right? Oh man. Just expressing and enjoying that love for God. Men, grow in this area. I challenge you today. How will your kids and my kids learn to love the Lord and worship God vibrantly, singing loudly, if you will not do it too. They won't, and we'll lose this. And so worship the Lord, get over yourself, raise your voice, and declare your love for the Lord, and back it up every other day of the week, and you will do well. Mary saw it, and Mary got it. As we continue to learn a little bit about worship, notice that Mary gave the best that she had in her worship to the Lord. Kind of what worship is, the heart of worship as it were. The best that she had, she didn't run out to the store and swipe a credit card, oh, I gotta get something nice for Jesus. She gave the best that she had currently, the best that she had to the Lord. That's what a worshiper does. If you want to grow in worship, understand what it is. It's not so much about everything else. It's your heart before God and giving all of yourself the best that you have to him. Oh, Lord, if I won the lottery, I'd give you everything. How about a dollar? Right? How about your loyalty? How about your fidelity? We all know what that word means, right? Yeah, that's where it counts, right? The best that she had, quite possibly her dowry, to the Lord. Not for Lazarus. Her brother just died. She didn't give it to him. Didn't anoint his body, right? But she pours it out on the feet of Jesus. Even our best belongs at his feet or on his feet. Even our best is only worthy of his feet. And so she anoints him here. She gave her best, the best that she had. And of course, it cost her to do this, didn't she? Verse 4. Everyone was blessed as the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, Mary's gift. Become a worshiper like Mary. You will be blessed and you will bless all those around you. But of course, there was a a complainer, a naysayer. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, possibly shamed by her devotion, I don't know, speaks up and interrupts the occasion, and he says what? He says, why? The first word uh, of this evil question, evil action, why? Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, a year's wage, as it were, of a worker? 
given to the poor. John clarifies for us here, a little behind-the-scene info. This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. John gives us insight, statements made. Well, why couldn't we have taken this money and given it to the poor or whatever? Jesus says, back off in just a minute. And we'll get to that shortly. John didn't know at this time that Judas stole from the money box. He probably would have punched him in the face. Like, you know, many of us might. Stop this. I'm kind of kidding a little bit, but, but not. Uh, uh, stealing from the, the money box, right? Dealt with this. A son of thunder. I mean, Peter's here. If this were known at the time, they would have dealt with it without question. John didn't know. You know who did know? Jesus. What? what? What's the deal with that? What's the answer, church? Why would Jesus let him keep the money box if he used to take the things that were put in it? Why? Grace, right? This guy had an issue with Lust with greed, and sadly, greed got the better of him. And it started slow, it started small. And maybe he just took a little, little, little bit here, a couple coins there, 300 denarii. I mean, that's going to set me straight, help me out for a long time. Little by little, small amounts, no doubt, uh, no doubt he started, and his greed got the best of him to the point where he betrays the Son of God, for 30 pieces of silver, right? One thing leads to another, doesn't it? Do not be deceived. Don't think that sin is not out to get you, that it will hunt you down and kill you if you allow it to. Why did Jesus let him keep the money? I mean, that's just crazy, right? We think to ourselves. But the Lord lets us get away with little things, doesn't he? From time to time, and we wonder, did he see? Did he know? Why hasn't he, if God were real, why didn't he stop me from doing that thing? It's called grace. Lightning didn't strike, did it? It will. Yeah, but each one of us has a space and opportunity that God gives to repent. It doesn't mean he doesn't see, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't know, and it doesn't mean that that sin won't kill you and shame you, because it will. It's not your friend. It's out to get you and to mock you and to ridicule you and put you on display in front of everyone to see, expose you. Numbers 32, 23. Be sure of this, right? Your sin will find you out. It's going to get you. It's going to come for you. Don't be deceived. Judas had a time. He had a space, and God gave it, and the Lord allowed this to occur, and then Judas made his choice, didn't he? If that's you today, listen up. Hear and respond to the appeal of God. Who sees all, he knows what you're doing. The space that you're being given right now, it's called grace. Turn from your sin, period. Turn to the Lord, knock it off, and find forgiveness, find grace. Find the ability to put handlebars on your Christianity and say no to sin. That's why we're here. Amen? Well, Judas complains and Jesus says, back off, buddy, right? We'll bring this to a close. Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for the poor. You have with you always, but me you do not have always. Back off. This is special. This is significant, right? It's a wonderful act of worship. A couple things Jesus is not saying. First of all, this is not justification for like opulent living where Christian leaders or pastors can say, well, back off, buddy. This is for Jesus, right? My airplanes. I don't know why that, that comes out, right? <laughs> this is for the Lord. So we're going to build this cathedral and we're going to spend billions and millions of dollars because this is for Jesus. Back off. That's not what this is. Right? Though some try to use this very text and say that very thing, God help them, because they're going to answer for it. Not an excuse for opulence, firstly. Secondly, Jesus is not making less of the poor who are in need. No way. 
consider all the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels. Not at all. What is this? This is a special, monumental moment, guys. Where this gift and, and an offering of worship, costly at that, is literally poured on the feet of Jesus. No one can do this today. No one could do this since. You can't do this. I can't do this, but Mary could. Because Jesus is. Consider that. The actual, physical, tangible feet of Jesus for like one more week. And Mary could give the best that she had, seeing, hearing, understanding, knowing what was coming, and everything would change. She gets to give this gift to the Son of God in flesh. Wow. I guess it is, Lord. I guess it is significant. I guess it is special, done directly to you, for you, because you are worthy of so much more than this. And yet, the gifts that we give, our Lord loves and he receives and he welcomes and he praises the worship of his people. It's not the oil, right? It's not a year's wage that really means something to the Lord. It's the offering that was given from a sincere heart. And there we go back to that lesson in giving. It's not the one who boasts and look how much they give and they make a big show. But even two mites, man. Given in sincerity, it's meaningful, it's special, it's worship to the Lord when it's given in that way. I love this principle. I love discussing and considering what worship is. God help us. To see it, to observe it, to grow from it. 